So what this question is really asking, and I'm going to um, I'm going to here we are. that's what I can do. I can screenshot this one. Um, we can look at the figures. Um, so it was really looking at the this particular reaction, which was the rotation of the S cis position, which is the one that's shown here. Um, and the to the S trans position. And what this what this is really showing is that one, we have these pi bonds in between carbons one and one and two, and then three and four. But when we get the most stable conformers, they wound up um, having their pi bonds overlapping and having resonance, which is, we talked about this last quarter when we talked about, um, when we talked about uh, resonance and cycloadditions. Um, so really what, Part of what this question is asking is like, okay, well, we expect there to be a um, a transition state in between these two. If you start from the S cis and you twist one of those carbons around, um, you're going to get a transition state where you've totally broken the resonance in between these two um, these two states. And so that one would look something like the transition state in between S cis and S trans would look something like this. Right, so if you start as S cis and you take those pieces and you, that are kind of shaped as a sort of a trapezoid sort of shape, if you take those and rotate them up, you're gonna get some transition state where you totally break the resonance, where your two pi bonds wind up being perpendicular to each other or close to perpendicular, um, and you can't have any resonance between those two pi bonds. Um, so that's the transition state that we expect to see when we look at, at S cis rotating to form S trans. The, this question originally was asking though, why do we see a second transition state? And if I pull up the um, the figure here, so if you look at the ro degree of rotation, um, and as we rotate this, if we start from the S trans, where we have those two carbons pointed in opposite directions, we find that to be the most stable state. So this is energy in kilojoules per mole on the y-axis and rotation, the dihedral rotation um, around that carbon two to carbon three bond. So if we start at S cis, that dihedral is 180 degrees. And as we twist those two carbons around to, to go starting from here to start moving towards the S cis, we go uphill in energy because we're breaking those that resonance up in order to do that. And so that's the transition state we expect to see. And that's the one that we see in the figures um, right here. This is the transition state that we expect to see. However, when we look at this potential energy surface, there's actually another transition state when we get to zero. When we get to, so starting from 180 dihedral. So got carbon here, carbon here, and carbon at my other thumb joint. So kind of picture my fingers as being the skeletal structure. This is our lowest energy state. As we rotate, we see a transition state at around 100 degrees dihedral. And then as we keep rotating, we get to another transition state when we hit that perfect S cis, when the molecule is totally planar, there's another transition state there. So that's what this question, and if you didn't see this question on the quiz, that was on purpose because I was trying to remove it, as I mentioned. 
Um, just some of you started the quiz before I realized I hadn't hit save. Um, so the question was, why do we see a second transition state? What is happening um, at this completely planar S cis position that makes it so that it's also a transition state? Anybody have any, any guesses? Can you repeat the question? So what is it about this molecule? And I can actually pull it up. Um, I'll let me open it up in MacMole. Um, what is it about this molecule that gives us a transition state right when we get to this perfectly symmetrical, perfectly planar state. When we get 1,3-butadiene and we rotate it around so that it's totally planar, it's still a transition state. This is what's going to maximize the resonance. You're going to have the most resonance possible by overlapping those pi bonds when you do this. So what is it that's making this also a transition state? and making it so this molecule or this geometry is slightly more stable. Because you have the forces like between, like as it's curved, the forces in the inside are kind of still pushing each other. So if you <laughs> twist it a little bit, it's a, like the, the forces are a little off. Exactly. So if you look, if we look at the totally planar version, if we look straight down that line so we can see that it's totally flat, we have sterics still. Just because we maximize the resonance here means, doesn't mean that the sterics go away. So if we're in the trans conformer, we don't have any of those sterics, right? This can be totally planar and be stable because we don't have those hydrogens bumping into each other. We don't have those electron clouds pushing on each other. But when we try to go totally planar in the cis s cis position, we get these two hydrogens bumping into each other. And we can actually see this. This is another thing that, that um, um, these ab initio calculations are good for, is we can actually show things like the um, electron density. That's the one I want to change. No. This one. So if we look at the total electron density, that's all of the orbitals sort of added together. So you can kind of get an idea for where all of the electrons are collectively. Most of the electrons are going to be inside this wire mesh. And you can see that there's enough electron density right here that's sort of going to be pushing on each other a little bit. Um, and you can actually, I changed the, was it the contour value? Yeah, we drop that down a little bit. You can see that it does wind up sort of pushing on each other that way. Um, and so this is actually, again, this is a, one of the useful features of ab initio calculations is we're actually calculating all of the individual orbitals, which means we can actually get a picture graphically of what these electrons look like or where a um, where partial charges are um, after we've run these calculations we can sort of sum up where the electron density is and where the nuclei are to figure out where any partial charges as well um, this is not a molecule we would expect to have much in the way of of a uh, partial charge but we can still see if we looked at electrostatic potential Um, and we see that this basically doesn't have anything other than the red, which means that it's all um, that's all roughly the same charge. And this does start to be tacked on. You guys do this. Um, 
is because I have a pretty nice desktop and it's still apparently is taking a long time to calculate this. Um, if we looked at something like acetone, we'd see a difference in color where there was a partial negative versus a partial positive charge. Um, not seeing that as much in this case because we're looking at a not totally nonpolar molecule. Um, and we can also, if we looked at the same thing here, we could, we'd be able to see 3D electron density that this does allow that those hydrogens to not be pointed right towards each other. Right, they wind up not bumping into each other as much. So that's all that question originally was looking at. If it seemed like it was asking it in a foreign language, it was because I was trying to give you the context and try to explain in words sort of this graph, the fact that we have a transition state and then we have another transition state. We have two local maximums on this graph. And it was about, it was looking at why that would be the case. All right, so that was the main thing I wanted to talk about as far as you know, how ab initio calculations still work. Um, is my is my video frozen? Yeah. Or is it just, okay? But you can still see the screen share. Yeah. All right. Then I'll close these out and see if that fixes things um, and stop the screen share in a second. We'll restart it. Um, and if you ask the the uh, experimentalists, um, there's an sort of an ongoing ongoing feud between the experimentalists and the and the uh, computational chemists or the theoreticians, um, sort of just like the debate between physics and math as to who's better. Um, the, the experimentalists will tell you the, the only good use for computational chemists is that they can make pretty figures. Um, and the, uh, the theoretical chemists will tell you that the only, that the, the experimental chemists have no idea what the heck is actually happening and they're just mixing stuff and seeing what happens. Um, and both sides are kind of right. All right, let's go. Let me go back and let's talk, look at some of the um, uh, review questions here. Um, do you guys get a chance to look at these? Do you have any of these in particular that uh, seemed worth going over? And some of these are going to be sort of qualitative. Some some of these are sort of some concepts that we kind of touched on, didn't really spend a ton of time on. For instance, um, we did talk about aldehydes versus ketones and aldehydes being more reactive. Um, all other things being equal, having more electron density on the carbonyl carbon is going to make it less reactive, less attractive to a nucleophile, right? Because nucleophiles are looking for a partial positive. So if we're looking at ketone versus an aldehyde, the aldehyde is going to be more reactive. How about if we put a bunch of fluorines on, on acetone, if we had hexafluoroacetone versus regular acetone, which of those is going to be more attractive to a nucleophile? The fluorine one, because the fluorine's pulling the electron density away from the carbonyl carbon. Yeah, so the same, it's the inverse. The ketone was, was less reactive because you had more alkanes that were donating electron density. If you have more halides that are pulling electron density, then you've got a bigger partial positive on your carbonyl, which means that that's going to react faster. Um, so. 
fairly straightforward and kind of follows our intuition a little bit. It follows the same logic as electron donating versus electron withdrawing, right? Same that we talked about for aromatic substitution. Um, our electron donating groups were the ortho para directors and our electron withdrawing groups were our meta directors. And because it was all about giving electron density or pulling electron density. So it has to do with resonance and um, electronegativity. If there's no additional resonance being added, then we're all talking about electronegativity. All right, we had some, some Wittig reactions we could practice too. And remember, anytime you see this triphenyl phosphorus or really anything where you've got a phosphorus and a carbon, that's gonna put a negative charge on that carbon and make it a nucleophile. And the result is going to be that we're going to, to um, we're going to be making an alkene group. We're basically swapping the oxygen for the carbon that's double bound to the phosphorus. And it, if you have an electron donating group uh, attached to your, your um, carbon, then that's going, that donating group is going to end up being in the Z position. So pointed towards the rest of, of the molecule. <clears throat> so for this bottom reaction, we're gonna wind up with Uh, we've got a carbon, what was the carbon oxygen double bond. We have an aldehyde on one side, and then we had these two phenyl rings, these two benzene rings. And because the group that's attached to the phosphorus carbon is electron donating, it goes into the Z position. So we'd wind up with this as our product, All right? Despite what sterics would suggest, sterics would, would um, have us instinctually wanna put these on opposite sides from each other, but there's more electron density and resonance issues happening that are going to make it all about electron donating versus electron withdrawing despite the sterics. Um, and this goes back to that first question that we talked about, the, Sterics are still there, but they're not always the dominant force. Sometimes resonance and electron density is more important than sterics. Right? It's always sort of a balancing act. And there's a reason we did sterics first. Sterics is pretty easy to wrap your head around, right? Electron donating versus electron withdrawing is a little trickier, um, which is why we're still getting used to that right now. Um, our other molecule here, again, is another aldehyde. We're going to replace the carbonyl for the aldehyde here. And a benzene ring has a bunch of conjugated pi bonds, right? And conjugated pi bonds means it's electron withdrawing. So an electron withdrawing group means we're gonna put that in the E conformation. So one, two, Three. Here's our pi bond we're adding. There's our new carbon we've added and just need to make sure we've turned this back to an aldehyde. All right, so we'd wind up with this conformation. And so it, it does, you can wind up getting the opposite stereoisomer if you switch which carbon is which carbon is attached to the phosphorus, right? Because this T-butyl group is electron donating. So if we had the benzene ring where the T-butyl group was and the T-butyl group where the benzene is, we'd get the we'd get the Z conformation because it's all about what's attached to the phosphorus that's on the on the or the carbon that's on the phosphorus. Right, so by switching those two um, pieces, we would get the opposite stereoisomer. 
just the same way that switching the order of our aromatic substitutions could change whether or not we are putting things ortho, ortho para versus meta, right? Um, 59 here is sort of a practice going one step backwards. So if they're not technically, I guess technically this is, these are synthesis questions, but they're pretty straightforward synthesis questions because you're only going to be one step back. Um, so remember that for the I mines, we started from, um, a carbonyl where we we had the oxygen where the nitrogen was. So for each of these, your starting reactants are going to be cut off the nitrogen, put an oxygen where it's attached, cut, cut the double bond, and put an oxygen where the nitrogen is. So that you're left with a primary amine and a carbonyl. All right, so for this first one, we would wind up with cyclopentanone. And then cyclohexylamine. These would be your two reactants. Right, because the single bond on the imine doesn't really change. The single bond stays there. We're just replacing the carbonyl with a carbon nitrogen double bond. And for C, <clears throat> again, this can be helpful to try and draw all the atoms more or less in the same direction so that you can keep track of the right number of atoms. So we're breaking the carbon nitrogen bond or replacing it with a carbonyl. The rest of the atoms so are still going to be in the same spot, except for the nitrogen. I rotated it so it was out of the way. This would be our starting material for C. <clears throat> And enamines, enamines are a little bit trickier though, right? So enamines couldn't make the carbon nitrogen double bond, at least not permanently. So it's the carbon that's attached to the nitrogen that's also attached to the alkene was our carbonyl, right? So to work backwards, we started from Cyclo, cyclohexanone and this five-sided ring amine. So for each of these, the line where I drew the, or the uh, bond where I drew the line is the bond that should have the carbonyl double bond. All right, so the big difference between these, between the enamines versus the imines, is the fact that it's a secondary amine. So we'd be starting with So for this one, we'd be starting with cyclohexanone. And then on the other side would be that, I'm not exactly sure exactly what the name of this even would be for that amine, because things get heterocycles, the naming gets a little bit weird. Um, so I would look that structure up for, to get the name. And we haven't gone through naming amines yet anyway. So don't be too worried about naming on these. 
Hmm. Right, you see how we got there? It's the, the carbon that's attached to the alkene and also attached to the nitrogen. Tells you where the oxygen was. Do one more here. Let's do B in this on this one. So now in this case, the bond that is where the carbonyl should be is where the is where the carbon is part of the alkene and also attached to the nitrogen. So the the amine that we the secondary amine we started with looks like this, and the keep or the ketone we started with looks like that. Right, so, and frankly, those are the, the enamines are the trickiest to see how the hydrolysis would work backwards or where you would be working backwards, right? Because for most, for almost all the other reactive groups that we've gone over for this chapter, you find the, the carbon that still has a, um, a pi bond and that's where the, that's where the ketone was, or that's where the aldehyde was, right? For the imines, for the oxymes, for the hydrozones, um, that was, or for the diac for the acetal, for that matter too. It's not a pi bond, but where you have two oxygens attached to a carbon, that's where your carbonyl was. For the enamines, it's a little trickier because you have two, you have more than one option as to what's attached to the nitrogen. So it's gotta be where the nitrogen is attached to the alkene. So just one more time for this one, you'd be chopping right there and putting a carbonyl. And then the pipe, the alkene bond goes away. And as long as we're right here, might as well just do this one too, right? So we put the carbon oxygen, Pi bond, the carbonyl group is right there. On this side, we had three carbons and then the nitrogen. So I'm going to put the nitrogen out of the way. And then we had some other substituents attached. So just make sure you re add those. So that's our secondary amine that went through and acted as the nucleophile to push the oxygen off and then went through that elimination rearrangement to. Um, to make the enamine. Questions so far? That imine and enamine formation is all acid catalyzed? Yes. Yeah, because it, it has to be. Um, uh... Let's double check that because you need the nitrogen has to be has to have a lone pair. So I think this is that reaction we said it had a sweet spot, right? You needed um, you needed enough acid around that you could protonate the carbonyl oxygen, um, but not so much that you protonate your amine because amines are a weak base. And if you protonate the amine, then there's no lone pair for it to use to, as a as a nucleophile. So I think you're right. I believe I remember it being. Um, I remember it being the acid catalyzed. I think it's around like four point five. If I remember correctly. Yeah. So acidic, but barely. Yeah. There we go. Four point five is that peak rate. So acid catalyzed, but barely. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, rather than just putting H3O plus, sometimes they will say catalytic H plus because it means like it just takes a couple of drops. You put a couple of drops of a strong acid in there to start the reaction and so that you have enough protons around, but you don't want to put a whole beaker full of concentrated acid in there because then you'll wind up protonating the amine as well.
All right. So 61, I want to look at because I want you guys to see that this is really the exact same question as above. So for six for 59 and 60, it said, what were the reactants that you would use to make the following imines or enamines? And this says, what is the major product if you have this and it goes through hydrolysis? Hydrolysis just means that you're undoing the formation of these enamines or these imines or the acetals. So it really is asking the same thing. One's saying, if you give put these with acid, what happens? And the other one's saying, what did you start with to get here? But the answers are going to be the same because it's what you start with to make the imine is exactly what you get when you hydrolyze the imine. Right, because hydrolysis is just undoing this formation process. Right, so the logic works the exact same way as what we were looking at right above. Um, if it's an imine, you're looking for where the double bond is. Break that, replace the nitrogen with an oxygen. If it's an acetal, you're breaking the, the two ethers, the two oxygens that are attached to the same carbon, that was the carbonyl carbon to start. That was that one in the middle was the carbonyl carbon to start. And if it's an enamine, where you've got the alkene attached to the nitrogen is where it was a carbonyl to start. All right, so they all kind of work the same way. And drawing these products, so A and B and C actually all would start with cyclopentanone. Would all the one of the carbonyl product for the hydrolysis for all of these would be cyclopentanone. So I don't know, I think drawing freehand rather than the straight lines might actually be better because that oxygen looks a little bit wonky. But so A, B, and C, the ketone that you make is going to be cyclopentanone for all of them. It's just what else is left over is going to be different. Dimethylamine for A, methylamine for B, that ethylene glycol or the 1,2-ethane diol alcohol where you have two carbons and an oxygen uh, an OH group on each carbon would be the other piece of C. And D looks complicated until we remember that we're just putting a carbonyl on that carbon that has two oxygens attached. And then both of the other oxygens still stay there and you just put an hydrogen on them. So you would wind up with Um, for D, you would get, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in our carbon chain. And right square in the middle is going to be a ketone. And then an OH on either side. All right, so the acetal formation was was happening when you you got that ox one of those oxygens on the end comes around and attaches the carbonyl and I think I counted my atoms properly one two three four five yeah so that would give us two five sided rings both attached to that middle carbon when we went through the full dehydration reaction. So we've added a lot of volume, but again, everything, all of these reactions, other than the Wittig reaction and that last Bayer's um, Bayer's villager oxidation, 
are the same mechanism with a little bit of different flavor is all. And if you happen to have a very complicated molecule like this, where you've got an enamine, an imine, and an acetal all in the same molecule, if you expose this to excess acid, you're going to wind up hydrolyzing all of those. So you'd wind up adding an OH group, or sorry, you're adding a, a carbonyl group here, here, and here, and wind up with the other pieces are still going to be left as the rest of the products. All right, so this is just asking the same thing as above, just three times on the same molecule. All right, I think we've we've reviewed this chapter pretty well. Um, your next or your assignment for this week now is to do the synthesis practice. So put some of this into action. Solve five of the following eight synthesis problems. Yeah, eight. All right, and these did come from this chapter. Um, if you have access to the solutions manual, please try to do it without the solutions manual first. Um, once you've given it a good go, anybody who wants the solutions manual for this problem to see all of the synthesis, I have no problem making that available to everybody. Um, I just want you to try and do it on your own first because um, like I said earlier, synthesis problems are the, are the type of problems where if you have the solution in front of you, it seems totally obvious. But getting to it on your own is more than just following an example. It takes practice to be able to see things sometimes. So give that your best go. Um, you guys all know that I'm not super picky on deadlines. If you need to wait to turn it in so that you can ask me a last question or get the solutions manual before you're comfortable turning it in, um, that's fine. Just email me and let me know, and I'll either tell you to turn it in the way it is, and then I'll give you the solutions manual, or we can work it through, you know, whatever it happens. Um, any questions on this week's assignment? So I actually have a question. Um, do we have to draw the mechanisms behind it or predict what causes this to happen to get these products? We need the, the series of reactions. I, you don't need to show the electron movement, okay. um, although it might be helpful for some of the steps to show what the intermediates look like, but that's not necessary. What I'm, what I'm looking for for each of these is, here's reaction one, here's the product after reaction one. Here's reaction mm -hmm. two, here's the product after reaction two. Okay. Right. Cody, did you have a question too? Yeah, I was just going to say I'm a little confused about the methylene dioxy ring. Uh, I don't know if you want to give it away or not. I just feel like that's a newer structure. On, on H? Uh, on A? On A. Um, so you do not... So there's two of them. H has something similar as well. You don't have this um, two ethers attached to the same molecule. They're attached to adjacent molecules. So that might look something like a, a hemiacetal formation rather than an acetal formation. You might start by making the um, you know, using meth methane diol as a reactant, if you have a good leaving group on an adjacent carbon as well, you could potentially make that. That's about as much detail as I'll go into for now. Cool. All right, so, and let me find a good 
Um, I'm just going to look up a pathway that I know is a No, uh, that didn't wind up. Um, so what I'm what I just want to make it clear, I don't want just the list of reactions, not just steps one, one, two, three, four, five, six. I want you to show the, the products for each of those reaction steps. So something that looks more like this. This is for a for a bio biological process, but something similar where it's like, okay, here's my reactant that I'm starting with. Here's reaction one in the and the reactants that I need. And here's your the um product of reaction one. Then there's reaction two, including the reactants that you need. And here's the product for two. So step by step, but you don't need to show the electrons themselves moving the entire mechanism. All right. So no curved arrows when it comes to showing the mechanisms, that's not necessary. Does that make it clear? <laughs> yeah, if you've had biochem before, uh, me, me Googling, I uh, should have should have came with a trigger warning um, for those of you who've had to memorize the Krebs cycle before. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, then that's all I have for new for the new assignment right now um i do have also noticed that there are still still more than more than um two of you who have not turned in that potential energy surface assignment so if you're still if you need help with the excel getting it to look the way you want it to look if you are still running into um errors trying to submit your jobs to um web games or um then we can do screen share and I can try and walk you through some of the errors and, and figure out exactly what's going on um, with those issues so we can make sure that everybody gets that assignment done. Since we've spent some time on it, let's finish, finish it up and get those turned in this week. And so I'll open it up to anybody who's still having issues with the um, ab initio lab. Or if you're good and just still um, working your way through it, then I'll mute and just ask questions whenever they seem relevant or whenever you run into issues, okay? Cody, were you able to get that, that transition state search to run? I'm gonna try it again right now. I've ran off to go have breakfast after that. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. All right, Thanks, just let me know if you run into issues. Cool.